Snake's Revenge is a stealth action video game developed by Konami and published under their Ultra Games label for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990. The game features a team of Special Force Commandos on a mission to... Wait! Nope! Nuh-uh. What? We're not bearing the lead! Rip the band-aid off! Get it out in the open! Snake's Revenge is a sequel to a popular game released on the NES in 1988, a title most gaming fans out there are well aware of. Well, yeah, right, but it, it's kind of complicated and there's just so much to talk about and- METAL GEAR! Okay, right, Metal Gear, the tactical espionage series that revolutionized stealth gameplay and spawned successful spin-offs. Snake's Revenge is tied to all that, sort of. I think it depends on who you ask. For example, if you were to ask this guy, he'd likely say, No, Snake's Revenge is not canonically connected to what we now know as the Metal Gear series. That's Hideo Kojima, games design veteran, a creative with an innovation-stacked track record. What incredible series did he help deliver to home computers in the back? half of the 80s? Penguin Adventure, a game about a strutting penguin who floats on clouds, gambles with fish, and... Oh, you cheeky little guy. Uh, yeah, true. But also, Metal Gear! The original Metal Gear was published by Konami for the MSX2 computer platform in Japan and Europe in 1987. This sneaky action game not only introduced the world to tough-as-nails protagonist Solid Snake, but to many gameplay elements we see in modern stealth titles today. Emphasis on covert puzzle-like traversal? Check. Unaware foe takedowns? Check. Wearing cardboard and freaking out when you accidentally inch forward and get caught by the enemy? Check. Metal Gear received high praise upon release and sold very well on the MSX2 platform. The game's success saw a port delivered to home consoles with a Famicom release the same year and a North American NES version in 1988. But this port? This is where the Metal Gear Hideo Kojima connection branches in very different directions. And things get weird. The original Metal Gear team did not work on the Famicom and NES port of the game. No. In fact, they never consented to a port being produced at all. The project was pushed to a different team in a different location, making use of the original MSX2 source code. Yikes. Yes, we've always been this bad. Despite making use of that original Metal Gear source code, this port was a different Metal Gear. The team tooling the game for consoles had to dial back elements due to hardware limitations. On top of that, they were told by management at Konami to make the game different from the MSX2 version. That sounds like an insane amount of work. How long did it take? <laughs> How long did it take? They were given three months. You're kidding me. Still very bad. Nope, and good on them, because they delivered. They produced the first official Metal Gear North American players could experience. But with so many constraints on the port, it begs the question, how does it play? Hmm, great question. Let's take a look. First things first, right off the bat, the English translation probably could have used another pass. Overall, the game doesn't leave a great first impression. The controls are stiff, and the hitboxes on enemies are really hard to read. The game is largely dependent on staying unseen, attacking incognito at just the right second. Unfortunately, you're gonna find yourself slapping air. A lot. Try to get a little closer, and... Yeah, that happens all the time. You're either too far away to connect or so close that you put enemies on alert. You gotta rewire your brain to understand the hittable sweet spots in this game. And even when you think you've got it, you probably don't. Hand-to-hand -hand combat isn't the only temperamental system in this port. General hiding ain't so perfect either. Sometimes you'll alert enemies even if you think you're well out of sight. Combination of flawed sneaks and clumsy melee leads to a lot of unnecessary frustration. How about game world gating that makes the player acquire numbered cards to open doors? Uh, it doesn't sound so bad, right? Plenty of games use keys. The problem here is that cards need to be equipped. This means jumping back and forth in a slow, clunky menu. Oh, and 
The doors? Not labeled. You never know what card you need to use on which door. Cumbersome when you have just a couple cards, but when you get more and more that are all utilized continuously throughout the game, every new entryway turns into this. You find a door, you try to open the door. You have the wrong key card equipped, you bring up the gear menu. Equip new card, you try to open the door. You have the wrong key card equipped, you bring up the gear menu. Equip new card, you try to open the door. You have the wrong key card equipped, you bring up the gear menu. Judge! Yeah. You'll have more fun playing 52 pickup. So, Metal Gear Port in a nutshell, wonky combat, underbaked stealth, questionable localization, and Snake's most treacherous foe is Metal Hatch with Handle. Right. All that said, is this a terrible game? Well, H Hideo Kojima's not a fan. He said, <clears throat> The NES version was a pitiful title, developed cheaply and simply by a small team in Tokyo. I came across the game in a bargain bin and tried playing it, but the game design is pretty bad. Strong words. And while we have had many irritations playing North America's Metal Gear, we also had a bit of a revelation playing both the NES and MSX2 versions back to back. The original MSX2 Metal Gear? Not perfect either. In fact, it shares some of the same flaws as its weird NES counterpart. Seriously, movement? Pretty darn stiff. Hand-to-hand -hand combat? Imprecise and hard to predict. The stealth system? Rough. Heck, when the MSX2 version of Metal Gear trickled to parts of Europe, even its translation was, um, not perfect. Oh, and, and the time-consuming, momentum-halting keycard shuffle started right there with the original release. Now, it's not to say that both the original Metal Gear and its NES port are the same overall quality, because they're not. Even with the jank overlap, the MSX2 Metal Gear still looks better and offers a world that, in our opinion, is more thoughtfully designed. The MSX2 release was an ambitious and important title. It solidified stealth genre staples and kicked off an impressive narrative. On launch, it was like nothing else. You can cut it some slack. The NES version? A three-month underbaked altered port. One that contains the flaws of the original and then adds more. It changes locations, story beats, it has no Metal Gear. Mm, uh, let's reiterate that. It has no Metal Gear. The walking tank the game's named after. They replaced the Metal Gear boss fight from the original game with this. A giant freaking TV. Yes, it's technically a computer, but I mean, it just looks like a big TV, right? That's just what it looks like. Oh, certainly way more visually appealing than a giant bipedal war machine. Anyway, with all those differences in mind, still, the core gameplay of the NES port is faithful to the original. It kind of made it work. The rejigged port was reviewed favorably abroad. It also proved to be quite lucrative for Konami. And when a game makes a splash and pulls in a fair chunk of change, it can mean only one thing. Say it with us now. Time for a sequel. Oh boy, great news. Konami must have speed dialed Metal Gear's original team to apologize about the port and then get the ball rolling on a proper follow-up. A, a game that could expand the ideas sewn into Metal Gear's innovative MSX2 release. Konami didn't tell them. What? Konami did not inform the original team that the company was making a sequel. But uh, how? Just as the company handled the NES port, they started a follow-up tailored for Western audiences without the consent of the original creators. They didn't know about it at all. Uh, that's baffling. They conceptualized Metal Gear. They did. The part wouldn't have succeeded if it wasn't for their work. You are correct, sir. I mean, wouldn't the original team end up finding out about a backdoor follow-up to their game? They all work at the same company. Oh, they did. And that's where the Metal Gear saga takes another definitive turn. Oh, gotta hear this. You see, heading home one day, Hideo Kojima had a conversation with an associate from the original Metal Gear team. This programmer had moved to the NES division of Konami. He informed Kojima that he had reservations about working on a sequel to Metal Gear as he personally thought any Metal Gear game should have Kojima's involvement. As you can imagine, the sequel oblivious Kojima was pretty surprised by this. He was also shocked to hear that the project was already well into production. No way! Hideo Kojima was told secondhand that a sequel to the property he helped create wasn't just on the table, but was already being made? And this was a pivotal moment in the history of Metal Gear. After the big news bombshell cleared, Mr. Kojima got to thinking, hey, what if I made a sequel to my game that isn't the sequel that those other folks are making? That's exactly how. 
Hideo Kojima sounds. And just like that, boom! The next week, he hands Konami a proposal for his vision. It gets greenlit, and that game? Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Released exclusively in Japan on the MSX2 platform in 1990, Solid Snake iterated incredibly on the groundwork of the original Metal Gear. That's right. Metal Gear 2 introduced the series' iconic radar system, improved enemy AI, unique and challenging bosses, new stealth mechanics, an upgraded weapons roster, a richer story, and an avalanche of other elements. It can be seen as a direct through line to the mega popular follow-up series, Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear 2 was an undeniably influential title in the stealth video game genre. Really cool, but uh, what about that other sequel? Sons of Liberty? It's pretty great. No, the other sequel. Snake Eater? Ah, one of my all time favorites. No, the other other sequel. Snake's Revenge, literally the first two words spoken in this video. The VR missions? Go on, man! You can't delay it any longer. We need to experience the regional exclusive sequel to the less report of the game that started it all. <sighs> Fine. It's time to hush up and expertly infiltrate the macho adventure that is Metal Gear's Black Sheep release. Let's get even in Snake's Revenge. On startup, the game rolls a cutscene. In it, we get something that was severely lacking from the game's North American predecessor. An actual freaking Metal Gear. Or it's schematics, at least. This 226-ton tank is capable of carrying and dispersing nuclear weapons from all angles, which is probably supposed to mean from any terrain or location. It's a deadly weapon that is notoriously difficult to take down. Unless it's replaced with a television. Yes, right. <laughs> Starting the game, we get a message for Lieutenant Snake. There's a weapon at the enemy's base. It could be, probably not a TV, Metal Gear. Snake's mission, investigate with his expert team, including infiltration pro, John Turner, and explosives disposal and weapons expert, Nick Meyer. Okay, cool. A couple of questions. Shoot, what the heck is going on? Where's Snake going? Who's the enemy? How do the bad guys have nuclear weapons and possible access to a Metal Gear war machine? <laughs> Yeah, not a load of details here, huh? Uh, let's look at the game box. Okay, okay here. It says that the villain from the first game, Vermin Katafi, sought asylum from another bad guy called Hayarola Kakamami after defeat. Hayarola Kakamami? Uh, Vermin Katafi? That wasn't the villain from the first game at all. Which, by the way, on the box art. It, I know, it I is. know, it is. So I they checked. wrote the sequel by yeah. just writing yeah. what they saw in the they box They looked at art. the box from the first one and then brought it over Jeez. to the second one. It says here that Katafi donated the ultra-chic nuclear attack tank Metal Gear to Kakamami as a thank you gift. Ooh, also a foxy spy named Jennifer helped Snake on his mission. This is so random. It's so dumb. Uh, oh, uh, wait, more in the manual. Looks like Snake and his team are heading to Ishkabibble, capital city of Terastan. Ter is Stan? They can't be serious. Oh, they are. Apparently, they're going there in order to infiltrate Hyarola Kakamami's compound in Terrorist Sanctuary. Fortress Fanatic. Which holds pots brimming with vital information. Pots? Prisoners uh, of terrorism. Oh, right. Pots. Are we done with the exposition, or should I continue molting brain cells? We should probably play the game. Yes, we should. The mission starts with Snake, John, and Nick separating into what we can only assume are the wilds of Terrastan. Here he is, folks. Tactical espionage specialist, Solid Snake. His iconic hunchback. His tiny baby feet. Hey. Skipping leg day helps the sneaks. Moving on to the next screen, it's dark, but we've got fireworks? I think that's supposed to be a flare. Looking at the game's HUD, we got Snake's life, some kind of ranking system. Oh, and would you look at that? Snake starts with a gun. How off brand. Right. Metal Gear titles usually have the hero start in seclusion with few tools. It forces the player to familiarize themselves with a passive approach to deadly scenarios. Strategic sneaking, stealth takedowns, close quarters combat. <laughs> These skills are naturally ingrained in the player as there's usually no easy way to deal with enemies at the start. Okay, that in mind, let's try to keep the sidearm holstered and stick with our mitts. Hold up, we've got a call. Activate the transceiver. Mr. Helicopter says we need to infiltrate the enemy base. Looks like we need to get information from our co-workers. Co-workers? Really? Are they a specialized military task force or desk jockeys? Never mind, keep moving. Who knows what blood-curdling war machines the enemy has sniffing us out. Are 
those go-karts with little spinny propellers? The manual calls them hella snoops. We've been spotted! Move, move! Uh, okay, maybe this won't be a walk in the park. Let's try that again. Here we go. Moving, moving. Avoid heli snoops. Nice. Looks like the coast is clear this time. Another flare. Oh, wait, what? The enemy spawned directly on us. How were we supposed to know he'd be there? The, the jig's up. Uh, book it. Go, go, go. Give up on passive play. We'll shoot our way out. So much for that. Really? Are they kidding with this? You can't just advance the screen in a stealth game, immediately place an enemy on the player, and then penalize them for getting caught. It's unfair. It's cheap. This doesn't bode well for the rest of Snake's mission. <sighs> Let's try it again. All right, we'll take the less subtle approach. Maybe we can run through most of this mess. Well done. And with one whole nugget of life left. Great. Hey, at least we can move on to... A nightmare of spotlights? Oh, jeez, come on! We can't see anything! Shouldn't the first level ease the player into the action? Look, this must be one of those pots we read about in the manual. Right! A prisoner of terrorism, cleverly hidden in plain sight, outside, with no guards. Maybe the pot has intel. The hmm. pot doesn't have intel. Ah, uh, well, no harm. We did a good thing and can get right back to sneakily sneak... Oh, come on! This is really starting to get on my nerves. As if enemies spawning in your face isn't bad enough, this level's designed so you have no time to react to spotlights. Lucky for us, enemy soldiers are about as smart as a mouthful of pack and peanuts. Let's keep moving. Okay, at least here we can try to get out of the- Gah! Game! No! You can't do that. You can't introduce security lights that need to be avoided and then penalize the player for trying to avoid them. We don't psychically know what's in the blacked out terrain. It's unknowable. We keep marching around, stubbing our brains on all kinds of early game dumb. Like when we discovered the ragtag militia shoots in eight directions while special forces super soldier Solid Snake only shoots in four. Or when we popped into plenty more frustratingly unavoidable stealth fails. <laughs> Or when we witness moments where the enemy should have spotted us, but didn't. What are the rules here? How do we get seen? How do we not? It's madness. We had dozens of teeth grinding visits to the land of game over. Eventually, we made it to the outskirts of some kind of base guarded by a bunch of henchmen that are immediately alerted when the screen loads. Take care of them and you'd assume you can open the door here, but no. Guess we have to come back with a key card that we don't have. A couple screens over, we get a message from our pal John, who tells us, hide at the main gate to receive information. Main gate? What main gate? We combed the entire stealth jungle labyrinth and found two entrances. At both locations, we didn't receive information. We try backtracking to the gate we were just at, and... <laughs> Uh, John, I don't think hide is an option here. The enemies hide bullets in my skull. Lost and not sure what the game wants from us, we revisit every section of the map. Yay. Loads of fun with stealth this broken. We got so frustrated trying to carefully sneak around that we actually invented a little strategy to take the stress out of moving through the jungle. We noticed two things happen when we're spotted by enemies. One, every section of the map lights up, taking away spotlights and other enemies. And two, this continues until a three enemy search crew is killed off. Three enemy soldiers, a pain to deal with. But one enemy soldier, Manageable. So, we left a single soldier chasing our tails through the friendlier forests of Terristan. Great way to get around. He's our angry little chaperone. Eventually, we went back to one of the gates, and this happened. Wait, what? Why didn't the enemy attack us? Why did John call? We came to this freaking location a gazillion times. Let's see here. I think we entered the screen slightly lower than we did every other time. Guess that's what John meant by saying, hide at the main gate. Hyper-specific positionally triggered events? I 
hate this game. John's awesome plan is put into action, which consists of him immediately surrendering and hoping they leave the door open. Masterful plan, John. You get captured and tortured, and I'll sneak through the door they might accidentally leave open. Things outside the box. Snake can now venture inside to reveal an industrial facility that has more of the classic Metal Gear vibe we know and love. Huh? Looks like we got the keycard system here, too. Hope they rejig the card juggling mess from the first game. We equip our level one door opener and poke around. It even lets us go outside. Hey, I remember this place. It was one of the gates we were trying to access earlier. Except now, there's a silencer on the ground. Guess it manifested at some point. Should be able to use our firearm without alerting enemies as easily now. Let's head back in and try it out. Dang it! Can't say that's the silencer's fault, but gosh, look at this! We can't take this guy out! Our bullets disappear after a few feet! Great. Nerfed bullets. Oh, we get it. They don't want weapons easily taking out bad guys from afar. Metal Gear titles are designed to make players focus on close quarters takedowns. Then don't give us a freaking gun. When enemy bullets travel the length of a screen and snakes mysteriously vanish, it looks really, really dumb. Eventually, we find a pot who tells us John moved to a different spot. We'll assume this wasn't of John's own volition. Again, great plan, John. Then we find keycard two, which leads us to officially confirm. We still need to shuffle cards to open non-labeled doors. Of all the things to bring back from the first game, this was not one of them. Our fancy new keycard gives us access to an enemy commander that can't be killed? Hmm. Okay. We're clueless as to what to do with this guy until we backtrack and rotate key cards on a couple of doors. That's when we find this. Truth gas. Good thing they leave this stuff just lying around. Time to go back to that enemy commander and fill him full of jabber juice. Our weapons are ready? Wow, sure am glad we spent precious time backtracking and risking our lives for that precious intel. More sneaks and super slick takedowns later. <laughs> gather equipment like a submachine gun, plastic explosives, and grenades. We even managed to pull an oxygen tank from a room filled with deadly wall farts. Spooky! Oh, Shane, look, cameras. <laughs> we dust Snake's corpse off the linoleum and find an elevator. Then something wild happens. Whoa, the game changes. We're now attacking and platforming from a side perspective. Looks like they've mixed Metal Gear with Konami's nonstop action super hit, Russian Attack. I mean, not, not well. In these sections, you'll do your best to stealthily take out enemies and avoid cameras while using an oxygen tank that's likely designed for a guinea pig. Water breaching the lungs in five seconds flat? I can hold my breath longer than that, and I'm not a trained super soldier like Mr. Snake here. Watch. <gasps> that's how Shane died. We really can't stress how terrible this plays. Stiff, directionally committed jumps combined with uneven terrain makes for super janky stealth and combat. The control layout changes to compensate for the added jump, and your equipment is used differently. It feels worse than regular gameplay, and regular gameplay ain't all that great. After a few stealth hitches, we make our way through the Tunnel of Loathe and into... Some kind of sports ball event. What? This can't be real. No, no one can, can avoid, avoid our, our attack. attack. Well, they weren't lying. What the heck's going on here? How could we be ready for that? Why is Team Terrastan practicing plays on Snake's spleen? I mean, we're not even grasping for straws here, right? This is straight up a football team. First boss and Snake's revenge, the John Madden Tackle Buddies. No, no, see, what you got here is you got the, you got your men uh, in a circle formation, right? And they're gonna come on down and, and they're gonna just, they're gonna knock Snake down. It, with all their force, all their might. See, you see over here in this section, 
direction. This is where Snake is, and and these guys have to go down there. Now Snake can go uh, over here or over there, but he doesn't have enough space to really go anywhere, so he doesn't really have much he can do. It really is. It really, really, really is really just a bad situation for Snake here. I, I personally don't see a way where he's going to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, survive to survive this at all. Snake died uh, 10 minutes ago, sir. Oh, no. well, I was too busy, you know, with the circles and the drawings. It's a really fun system. We fumble to the floor every time. We try our fists. Our fancy new machine gun. Oh, my spine. They're going all the way this year. The only way to conquer the Terrastan home team is by picking them off one by one. Sure, they'll treat Snake's body like the baby-footed tackle dummy he is, but you just gotta walk it off, shoot, and then chomp down whatever rations you got. Hey, being a punching bag may look like the easy way out, but it's our Hail Mary. Time to get out of here. We stab a couple orange boxes a billion times. And then we're out of the warehouse. And onto some kind of ship dock where we immediately get a call. It's Nick, the team member not having hot poker shoved down his pants. Nick tells us that John is a hostage on the ship. How does he know this? Was John allowed to make a call between pummelings? We find the ship and jump on. And lucky us. It pulls from the dock as soon as we board. Ha, huh, almost feel sorry for these bad guys. Stuck at sea with me, Solid Snake, the sneak dude, the mad demon of stealthy snoopification. <laughs> Now, you may have noticed that we're approaching enemies and trying to take them out in very distinct patterns. That's because at this point, we've kind of figured out that enemies are alerted by Snake if he's in their field of vision orthogonally. That is to say, if Snake is directly in front, behind, or to the sides of an enemy and they face him, they get alerted. For example, when we were riddled with bullets a moment ago, we weren't in the soldier's field of vision until our punch pushed Snake into it. That's our bad. Sorry, Snake. Huh, no problem, guys. Sneak both of you later. Better watch your bags because sneaks are on their way. Yes, sir. What? 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 Oh, huh. Oh, nothing. I swear I'll sneak you so sneakily. Oh, gosh, the sneaks are a creepin'. But even knowing how the enemy's cockroach AI ticks, you still can't account for everything that happens in Snake's Revenge. Like this. Screen changes that shove you directly into the enemy sight line. How are we supposed to know where the enemy's positioned before we enter the screen? It's impossible to predict. It turns the first few laps around any new section of the game into a fun life or death flow chart. Looks like I should have known better than enter from the left. Shame on me for just trying to play this game. Don't worry, we got real used to the layout of the deck. We poked around, juggling key cards for a while. We got a flare bomb, explosives, truth gas. We even found other NPCs like a pot that revealed Princess Cool Plan was in another castle and an enemy commander that wanted to burn everything to the ground. Let's destroy the ship and ammo dump. I like that guy. And then we march around those same places some more, because honestly, we couldn't figure out what to do next. Yeah, we snuck over every inch of that deck repeatedly, juggled cards to re-enter every accessible door, like this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. We kept poking around, grasping for straws, punching walls in hopes of finding some obtuse secret passage. After a good 25 minutes of scratching the walls of the ship, we notice this weird design on the wall, and of course, it's a door. Dear gosh. Oh, it seems almost stupidly obvious now, but it's not our fault. The game conditioned us to think a door on this ship has to look like this or this. Uh, whatever, we finally have access to the lower parts of the ship. All we have to do is hop aboard the jankiest little belt lift in the world. Uh, okay, wait. Here, hold on. Let's try, we got this. One more time. Yay! We start exploring and get a call from Captain Whirlybird. He's apparently coming to save us from this nautical nightmare. Good. But we're not safe yet. Look, here, here are three graves for you. 
know what that means? Not a clue. Oh, uh, looks like we stumbled into boss fight number two. The husky lemon grenade guys. These yellow porkers hurl blammo balls all over the place. This is not exactly an easy space to dodge their blasts. <laughs> You gotta keep moving and, and do your best not to retread the same area. Even then, you'll probably take loads of damage. Soon, we started making a bit of headway, taking out one chunk after another. One more to go. Make him Swiss cheese, Snake. Zua? How did I die there? W wait, I mean... Bleh. I don't understand. We were doing so well. What the heck happened? Whatever. One more time. We got this. There. One last creep on the ropes. Uh, can we see that again? We won. I, I mean, we died, but, but but we won. Wait a sec. I think I know what's wrong here. Look at the floor. Holes. Oh, three holes. It all makes sense now. What do you mean? It, no, it doesn't. The bosses chuck grenades from those very spots unscathed. And I'm pretty sure we ran through at least one of those holes earlier without issue. How do the death holes work? Some stupids are best left unstupided. My friend, it's over. We got key card three. Yay, another key card to cycle through on every single door in the game. Our new key card allows us access to a mine detector. Further below the deck, we find a shipment of what appears to be several mech-like super weapons. Ding, 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 ding. We can finally confirm it. Snake's Revenge has real deal Metal Gears. This is the happiest disappointment I can ever feel right now. In another room, we find a huge ammunition cache. I think we all know what we gotta do. Hooray! Our eye in the sky rings and tells us to skedaddle. We gotta go fast. We use our radar for the first and only time in the game to race the clock and rally with our helicopter friend outside. Mission accomplished. Congratulations, Metal Gear is destroyed, but we have confirmed the existence of Metal Gear 2. Now Nick is missing. Contact your person at the enemy's base. Wait, there's more game? No! <sighs> Old snaky baby booties reporting for duty. Great, we've got more crappy sneaks to do, and now Nick and John are missing. Snake's in some kind of war-torn section of Terristan. We march along until... The ground explodes. Guess that's the game letting us know there are landmines in this section. Thanks. Now I know mine booms. Anyone seen the ankle? We break out the mine detector and search around carefully. And then we get a call. Rats, looks like our transceiver's out of juice. Our coworkers weren't exactly knocking the ball out of the park with helpful hints anyway. Keeping an eye out for annoying mines, we eventually decide to see if we can clear them without hurting Snake. is taunting us for freaking experimentation. Everyone, Snake found ankle. I'm lay sleeps now. Why was some rapid fire rocket soldier hunched under a pile of sandbags? How long was he smushed under there waiting to be unleashed? You know we'll never get answers. When we continue, we find a battery. Looks like we can get our transceiver back up and running. Let's see what that call from earlier is about. The secret entrance must be somewhere on the grounds. Secret entrance? Uh, let's explore the area some more. Found some remote control missiles. Found another pot. He tells us Nick says to be careful of John. Hmm, what's that supposed to mean? We keep searching the different doors in the area. We find more ammo, more equipment, but no sign of that secret entrance flyboy was going on about. The secret entrance must be somewhere on the grounds. Yeah, we looked, buddy. No doing. Wait, on the grounds? You don't think he means undergrounds. Underground. Guess we have to blow up every sandbag in the zone until we find an entrance. Great! Looks like there's a rocket soldier parked under every single one of these things. And, and look, their rockets are heat seekers. Also, the enemy seems to have invented a handheld launcher that fires projectiles almost as fast as Snake can fire a handgun. Impressive. 
Screw this. Time to fight fire with fire. We use our remote-controlled rockets to slowly take out the enemy one at a time. Loads of fun. It isn't until we've almost given up hope that we kablooey the last sandbags, take out the soldier, and find... The secret entrance! Oh yeah! Oh no. Not another one of those terrible controlling 2D sections! Ah! We gotta head underwater and pray our full oxygen tank takes us to the other side. What? A grate? The underwater tunnel is gated?! Our oxygen! No! How are we supposed to get past this thing? You know, I don't think we've ever played a game so passionately set on preventing the player from continuing the game at every turn. It's gotta be done on purpose, right? How do we take out the grate and get the snakester to the other side? Plastic explosives. Too easy? Well, here's another grate you have to hesitate at while you wait for it to disintegrate. Neat. Even when you make it through, there's still more of that crappy controlling 2D gauntlet gameplay to rigidly hop and shoot through. Finally, we're out. Oh, hey, another canister of oxygen. Would have been very helpful 10 minutes ago. He burst back into daylight and immediately get a call. It's John. He's been captured, but he set up a transmitter on some train. Yeah, don't worry, buddy. We're on our way. Wait. Didn't that rescued prisoner warn us about John earlier? Oh, come on, it's John. You know, John. Look at him, lovable scamp. Don't you just want to tussle that hair? I think we should be cautious. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh boy, trains. John was just talking about a train. How convenient. Right, that's what we're saying. It's a little too convenient, right? Shh, shh, hold on. We're getting another call. Ooh, maybe it's John. Let's see here. <clears throat> There is no trap on the train. You, you can't, can't be serious. serious. No trap? Thanks, John. It's great that he's always looking out for us like that, telling us of places with no trap. Hey, uh, fellas. Yeah? yeah? I don't think John's seen this room. We've got pattern-based stabby floors jutting in and out of existence. Not easy to traverse, even when you think you've got the pattern memorized. We run forward to the next car. Almost immediately, there's another ring to our transceiver. Take a wild guess who's on the other end. John? Oh, it's John. I'm in the third car. There are no enemies here. Hmm. Thank gosh, I don't want to deal with enemies. On my way, buddy. But before we make it to John, we find ourselves in a mini boss encounter. You have been trapped. Ha, ha, ha. The enemy makes use of Claymore mines. These fire off chunks of wide range shrapnel that is a nuisance to avoid. Luckily, we have a machine gun and plenty of health. It's not a long battle. Moving along, we find another room with an ammo crate at the far end. When we swagger on over to grab the goods, we don't have a fraction of a second before. Guys, call me crazy, but I'm starting to think John is not being totally upfront about the safety of this train. Oh, you think? Ha, ha, ha. We carefully work our way through more cars. Despite being on edge, it's almost impossible to avoid floor traps in this section. They happen incredibly quickly. Luckily, we learn from our deaths. We find a new key card to expand our annoying door opening routine. We also find an x-ray camera. In time, we finally get to the person that got us aboard this chugging metal death machine in the first place. Johnny John, J Cakes, Juicy Juice, how you doing? Uh, Snake, chances are pretty good that this here is a trap. All right, Captain Negativity, geez. Then I'll inch ever so gingerly over. John's totally off my Christmas card list. That's not John. In fact, it's a spy, another of the game's deadly bosses. He deploys more shrapnel dispersing mines and is capable of absorbing a ton of damage. Between dodging explosive attacks and doing our best not to fall into that big black void, we die plenty of times here. We were eventually able to take him out with more than a few well-placed missiles. And when the dust cleared, something was left behind. A powered armor? Oh, John, I'll keep your red robot arm thingy close to me always. Feels like only yesterday you were saying, I am not John Turner, I am a spy. 
<laughs> it was pretty great like that. Uh, don't. The train comes to a stop, and we're out. Running through more shredded streets, we use our X-ray camera to find weak walls, our powered armor to shift rubble, and plastic explosives to make holes. For once, we actually feel like a big bad special ops dude. That is, when we're not spinning a Rolodex of key cards at every single door. Or assuming we can walk forward freely in another side-scrolling section. How silly of us. Fun fact, when Snake crouches in this part of the game, his shoe color changes from black to ruby red. If he could only click his heels together and wish to be in a better game. Stop scoping my baby feet. Later, we meet two soldiers who are probably the worst security guards of all time. You see anyone? No. Okay, good. You see anyone? Okay, good. Then it's back outside where we get a call from Jennifer. She tells us to meet up with her at the main base. You remember Jennifer, right? The foxy spy that's supposed to help Snake? Actually, I think there was more about Jennifer in the manual. Ah, here. Rumor has it that she's the younger sister of Ginger from Gilligan's Island. Hmm. You think Kojima knows Metal Gear's linked to a 60s sitcom with a bamboo Geiger counter? I think if he was involved in any way, he'd at least put Snake and John's character portraits over the correct descriptions. Back in the game, we come across another wild boss encounter. Oh, enormous munitions jet by Snake over and over. What the heck's firing at us? That's when we make two epic discoveries. One, there's a massive tank gunning us down in the next screen over. Two, the bridge hasn't been safety checked. If you think that's stupid, check out how our next attempt pans out. We decide to cut the crap and run right into the action. And die just as the next screen pops up. I don't care what anyone says, there is no way to prepare for something like this. The only way it feels like you can beat this thing is by placing landmines in spaces it may roll into. But because you can never guess where the tank is located off screen, you get snakes smeared into brickwork in the process. Plant a double digit barrage of mines just right while avoiding the unreadable tank's off screen movements and the most satisfying boss bye-bye so far. With that unfair metal behemoth blasted to scrap, it's time we finally got Snake into the enemy's main base. The next sections of Snake's Revenge are only mildly notable. We get more cards that prolong the painfully dull door-opening guessing game. We free more pots and interrogate commanders, finally realizing this eventually ups our rank, increasing Snake's ammo and health limits. And of course, we die. A lot. Sometimes from our own negligence. Other times for assuming this game was developed with any form of sympathy for the player. Silly us for thinking we can board a gondola by walking right onto the gondola. Of course, we need to hop on top. Soon, Jennifer gets in touch again from inside the enemy base. She tells us she's found the plans for Metal Gear 2. No, not the plans for a far better sequel. These are plans for a second Metal Gear weapon that the enemy wants to use to launch nuclear missiles all over the world. Criminy! We have to hurry and take that thing down! Hold on, maybe this pot knows where it is. I'll ask. Never mind. As we get closer to what we can only assume is the end of the game, things get more frustrating and very, very weird. Uh, excuse me, bad guys, I think your henchmen are broken. We soon learn that the leader of this evil organization's only weakness is the soles of his feet. Whoa. I think I get this guy. We also enter an area where naked statues smile smugly and launch heat-seeking rockets before looking down at themselves. Look, we told you things get weird. A little further and we get another message from Nick that reads, Lieutenant, it was careless of me. I, uh... What? What happened to Nick? Was he hurt? Was he just having a hard time remembering what he was careless about? We don't have to wonder too long because we run into Nick quickly and our buddy, he's not looking so hot. What are you talking about? Nick's fine. Look, he's happy to see me. He's pumping his upper back butt with excitement. We grab another key card and Nick tells us we have discovered that Jennifer is a spy. This we're pretty sure is supposed to read they have discovered Jennifer is a spy because Jennifer isn't a turncoat. She was caught spying for us and is now held hostage by the enemy. Anyway, Nick goes on to inform us that a life support system is in Big Boss's room and that he needs to be let out of the room in order to be destroyed. Huh, okay, so that's how we destroy Big- wait, 
What? Big Boss? That's what it says. What happened to the characters we read about on the box and in the manual? Katafi, Cockamamie, aren't they the villains? This is the first time we've heard anything about Big Boss being anywhere near this game. Big Boss was the twist main villain of the original MSX2 and NES versions of Metal Gear. Looks like we're hit with another Big Boss twist in Snake's Revenge. Wait, but the, the villain can't be Big Boss. Snake needs to take out Colonel Katafi. Look, it says so on the back of the box. Your two best friends took the brunt of his frenzy and lost their fight to live. Lost their fight to live? Man. Snake needs to avenge them. It's why the game's called Snake's Revenge. Yeah, uh, about that? Katafi, Kakamami, heck, most of the lore on the back of the box or in the manual, it's never brought up in the game. Seems that Snake is never actually out to get revenge in Snake's Revenge. Perfect, perfect. The only person that seems to want to settle a score is Big Boss, I guess. Probably still peeved we broke his fancy TV in the first game. Well then, I say we bring the fight to him. In order to get to Big Boss, we have to go through a bunch of rooms, all of which have multiple doors. You know what that means? Finally, after what felt like hours of poking in and out of menus, we burst into Big Boss's main room. He explains that Snake destroyed Metal Gear 1 and made him a cyborg. Which, okay, sure. I guess we'll just have to take his word for it. Time to brawl! Big Boss isn't exactly the clever war tactician he was made out to be in the other games. Here, he fires a machine gun in Snake's general direction. Easy to avoid after marching behind a pillar, we shoot a couple dozen guided rockets at his face until... He turns into... Robocop? Holy crap! Criminally untelegraphed twists keep a coming! Big Boss is now taller and sassier than ever. He laughs at us and tells us he has no weak point we can penetrate. Hold on. Weak point? Penetrate? Weak point? Penetrate? Weak point? Penetrate? Penetrate. Penetrate. Hey, didn't we just hear something about a weak point? Oh right, his tootsies. You know, canonically, I'm this guy's clone, so all the weird foot stuff in this game is actually making a lot of sense right now. Remembering what we were told about the life support system in his room, we pull Big Boss out of there. Then it's simply a matter of laying out a few landmines under that Achilles heel of his, and... Robo Boss is no more. But wait, there's no time to celebrate. Metal Gear 2 immediately becomes operable and we're hit with a countdown timer. It's up to us to stop this death machine from raining nukes all over the world. We find a tied up Jennifer near Big Boss's final room. She points us to Metal Gear's secret location. There we once again need to use guided missiles to take the thing out. Looking at this, you wouldn't think it'd actually be that hard to do, but guiding the missiles through correctly and hitting the front of the mech is a serious pain to accomplish. You have to time every missile's movement ever so precisely. We lost a lot of missiles trying to take this thing out, but eventually we cracked the giant robotic walnut wide open. Hooray! I killed war. With Snake having completed his mission, the UN declared World Peace Day. Unfortunately, Nick and John didn't make it out of this mission in one piece. That's too bad. But you know what? I'm not sure we made it out in one piece either. Uh, I get what you mean. A single Snake's Revenge playthrough really takes its toll. A stealth game this broken gnaws at your very core. There's just so many problems. Terrible stealth. Splintered story. Unknowable screen transitions. Archaic keycard system. Mega cheap boss fights. No chance death traps. Awful 2D sections. And on and on and on. <laughs> It's even worse when you consider this. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was released within a few months of Snake's Revenge. That's two sequels to the first Metal Gear launching practically in tandem. Yeah, and seeing what was accomplished in Solid Snake compared to what was delivered in Snake's Revenge is mind-boggling. The MSX2 sequel fixed off-screen enemy placement issues with a radar system that added tactical depth to gameplay. <laughs> Enemy AI was enhanced beyond seeing in straight lines. They could lock onto Snake and hunt him down, creating nail-bitingly thrilling stealth moments. 
Snake was given new moves like brawling and knocking on surfaces, adding nuance to enemy distraction, and world traversal. There were quality of life improvements like an easier to navigate communication system and simplified access to items. And look at this, they consolidated key cards. Good golly gosh, you didn't need to test a gazillion key cards on every freaking door. We're just scratching the surface here, people. There's an honest to goodness, compelling story, great fourth wall breaking moments, and constant clever twists to gameplay that keep the experience feeling fresh even all these years later. It is a fundamental mega leap in quality over its predecessor. Look, the MSX2 and NES were two very different platforms. Each had strengths and limitations that would inevitably shape a different sequel to Metal Gear. But what we got in Snake's Revenge didn't try to build on ideas from the NES Metal Gear release. It regurgitated many of its mistakes and took a big, sloppy step backwards in terms of story, gameplay, and fun. But don't forget, without its existence, Kojima might not have been inspired to pitch another entry of Metal Gear, spawning a continuation that built into one of the most beloved video game series of all time. Oh yeah, it, it totally did that. But this game, Snake's Revenge, put us through the pain. It's time for us to get vengeance. It's time for us to drop the controller, walk away, and alert the world, Snake's Revenge? It's just bad. Oh wait, Terristan. I think I get it now. It's because the game is terrific, right? Guys? Guys? Guys! Dun, 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 Old Snaky Baby Booties, reporting for duty.